good name. He said, what's your name? So Tony, as you can tell, is, is not here today, which is why I have to talk to Tony about this story. You can see that he's out there in the field trying to find it. But I will not try to do it for him at all because I don't want to. And you want to not do it, huh? <laughs> so in the interest of self-preservation, kiddos, get on out of here. So like I was saying, Tony is not here today, and, um, and, but I want you to know that, that uh, we are on his heart and uh, on his mind, and he's praying for us, and I would love for us to pray for him as well. He's back east. He had a quick business meeting, and then he had to go down south to meet some family, and his brother passed away not too long ago, and um, so he's been in a very difficult thing with his mother and his father this week, but to have him step out a little bit further is good, and he's been praying for us and asking for help. Even though Ryan and Adrian are good brother Cody, you guys know, and they have gotten us some very good care and help and love, and they told him and his wife Jenny that they had not been well enough to stay two weeks, and that's not too bad. But Jenny is in so much pain right now. Guys, you could be so thankful that God has a way for us to be with him and to help him and to help him and to help him and to help him. this message in Joshua about the Israelites moving, and then the week that we're getting ready to, to do this message, it kind of kicked off this thing, uh, we get a great offer in my new house to rent a position, and we're hopefully not too far off soon, so I'm going to do that for the first time, and then we're going to be moving as well, and so it's really kind of fun, and it's a good story. So in Joshua chapter 1, we're looking at this introduction of the Israelites who've been walking around in the desert for 40 years, kind of aimlessly without direction. And they finally start to move. So I'm going to give you a second to move your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Segways. Is there any avid exercisers in here? Like, I love exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I work with uh, Keith and Kayla on that all the time. Okay, is there anybody in here who thinks they should probably be more of an avid exerciser than they are? Yeah, okay. All right, now we got more people involved. <laughs> anybody in here ever ran a marathon? Once. Okay, we need more people involved. Has anybody ever heard the word marathon? Oh, look it. This, this is going to be good. Everybody sees what we're talking about now. Okay. My mom, at the ripe old age of I won't tell you when, because she'd be mad, uh, decided that she wanted to be a marathon runner, which by default meant that my stepdad decided he was going to be a marathon runner. But my marriage guy didn't know how that worked. So they run marathons, like all over. My mom's run Utah and St. George and like all over. And it's amazing that she's able to complete these marathons. I've gone and seen one of them in Huntington Beach, California, which is uh, kind of my hometown, which is fun. And it was quite possibly the most awful spectacle that I've ever seen of humankind. I've been to war, and that marathon was worse. 
I don't get it. What would make any human being consciously decide that they are going to stand in a group of people, wear the weirdest type of clothing, a jacket at first, only for the purpose of, I don't know if you know this, Marathon Runners wear these fancy running jackets that they spend so much in the mile anyhow. And then around mile three, when it gets warm, they just, I'm not going to say that, but they, they, they just unzip the jacket and they fling it away. And then somebody else picks it up and then that's their jacket. It's just a weird marathon tool. I don't know what that's for. Okay? And then they run. Run, 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 run. And then they keep running. And it's, it's, it's absurd. For 26.2 miles? Who the heck does that? Energy. All of that. The stamina. They just run and run and run. It's absurd. And here's the deal. They, if I did that, I would need like to drag like a, a something behind me full of water. But when they run, they only bring like these little bitty water bottles, three of them that they put on their belt, like normal belts and stuff like that. I'm not a runner, but that, and that's the only water they get. They're so dehydrated by the time that they're done. Okay? So my mom's running this marathon, and so my brother and I offered, offered to be her like her pit crew for the marathon. We're not going to run the whole thing. And there's a couple of times where the course kind of passes one central location and one empty beach. We say, we'll, we'll get a couple bicycles, and then we'll just ride the bicycle. And then when the, we see her coming, we'll be there and be like, yay, go, Mom, because we need a lot of chin your mom on that one. Okay? And so we're, we're, but throughout the day, I got to see people run a marathon. And it was laughable. They look like they're in such pain. And they're all sprinting like this. And some of them are like bleeding from fear because they get your shirt rubbed on you and it causes blood. There's some people that are so committed on the time that they don't even stop to go to the bathroom. They just keep running. Like, who would do this? But here's the thing. Every one of them that starts knows that 26 miles is not enough. 26.1 miles is not enough. They run and expect them in order to be able to take the complete attention that they want and to get their body working. 26.2 miles. And if you track that down and you, you take that from your head to where you're going, you could expect to be anywhere from 110 to 120 miles. We used to tell people, I'm a marathon runner. I never actually finished a marathon. But I've ran in some. Nobody can say I did that. I'm a marathon. Oh, but I got really, really close. So? Nobody cares. Okay? It's all about finishing. It's all about being willing to take that final step to go where you need to go in order to be there. It's willing. As believers, we should be progressing and not trying to go for the final thing that we can get to that we need to have. You want to see the attendance clear out quick. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, in our Christian faith, we don't do the same thing that the rest of us do. So what does it look like? Not in the context of like, well, I just need to make sure I'm not hurting anybody. How do I deal with it? We should be continuing to be missional. We should be continuing to go where he says to go. Whether it's in a personal way or a corporate way, we should just be obedient. We need to be obedient to him. Even though it looks like the cart may be stacked against us, we still need to do what the rest said. This is way too hard. Are you aware of who already lives in that land that God said we're supposed to go there? They're huge. They're angry. There's no way that we could inhabit that land. 
so they made a decision to wait. And here's how waiting works. When you decide that you're going to wait, God finds your patience. I'm sure the Israelites thought, well, if I wait, I'll get it. You see, we serve a God who's not hindered by time. But the king of our world is. We're going to wait on him. We have been waiting for over 90 years, and we are going to wait until everybody who said that it couldn't be done in six months is going to be able to say, no, we have seen the people who have been called to wait for these people. You see, the Israelites thought before bringing them to where they were going to go. For them, it was the point of unbelief and the hope that the people had not known the Lord. So after Moses is dead and gone, there comes this guy named Joshua. And Joshua studied under Moses. He was a fascinating, man to be involved with. He was probably what we can figure as a youth, grew up in slavery in Egypt. So he was familiar. He had the young memories of what it was like to be a slave in Egypt. And then, with Moses, walked out of Egypt. With Moses, took all of the Israelites. He walked and he studied under Moses. He was a phenomenal disciple of Moses. He followed him everywhere and learned everything that he could. And while Moses was unwilling to take the tribe of Israel into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb said that they would want to do this. So Joshua and Caleb are shared, and they are saved throughout the next generation. And now we have Joshua, a leader of the tribe of Israel, after the people of Israel, after Moses has passed away. And Joshua is ready to go in the promised land. Let's start with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them as free to do what you want. I will give you your every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend to the desert of Lebanon from the great river to the Euphrates, all of the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. So when we're looking at this concept of neighbor, we need to first understand that any time that we're called to go anywhere, it's a challenge. And if we're challenged to be given and God has challenged Joshua to take the people to the place that he is with them. Joshua, this great military leader, Joshua was a great man to be involved with his king when he was dead. He says in verse 2, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them as free to do what you want. You see, after Moses died, God challenged Joshua to possess the land. This is not a decision to accept God. Joshua had no conceivable reason to be scared when the earth was at its ground breaking point and he said, no, let's run the risk of battle. Joshua knew that if he was the one called to take the land, he was not going to be scared. Who are we working with? The Israelites. They've had one opportunity take this promised land, and so far they are at 100% ready to go. What are they telling them to do? They are telling them to move in a direction that they have yet to move. When? Hmm. Where? Sounds like the Ark of the Covenant. The Israelites were really good at this little detour that they had. Once Joshua had been with the Israelite people, he knew what they were doing. He knew at what point and who he was going to take them to. Joshua had walked with the Israelites for 40 years in the Roman desert, watching what they managed to go in the desert to get to. Who are they helping? They're someone like Joshua who had taken the land for them. And Joshua had the understanding of how to take the land that the earth was at ground level. to go to the land that I am about to give them as free to do what you want. 
we're just going to be sporadic. No, I need to go to Utica. Courtney likes to get ready. I like getting ready. Get ready. The Israelites were preparing to walk where they had never walked before into the land unknown to them. They were a brand new generation of people. Not one of us knows what the future holds for each of us. We're given visions of what's to come. We're given understanding of the future. We're given a calling. We're given a plan of God. None of us is perfect. None of us has lived this threatened life of being doomed. We're not perfect. There's no way of knowing what's to come. So we're struggling with this thing. How do we get ready for something that we don't know is going to happen? How do I pack for a trip when I don't know where I'm going? Is it a bathing suit or a snow globe? Both. Margaret says both. See, each day we face new and unknown things. Most of us fear the unknown. I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then he'll be true to his word again. And be strong and courageous. Because you will lead all these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and courageous. You see, God's committed. God doesn't say, hey, go there, good luck. Before we were all in, in this process of the Christmas, God was all in. I love it. I mean, think about that. In a valley full of churches, full of people, we haven't even put a building on the market yet, and we literally have people knocking on the door wanting to walk into the land. No. 
No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. I'm greater than time. I'm greater than this real estate market. I'm greater than an assessment. I'm greater than anything. I am greater than everything. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Spirit of God is very, very real in our lives. He did it before. He'll do it again. He's very much here. So if you're here today, I would ask you, how do you know that Jesus is real? Because he's very real. God's commitment here is simply this piece to it. Joshua could accept the challenge because he recognized God's promise to him. In essence, God said to Joshua, if you accept this challenge, I'll commit myself to you. You won't be one of the slaves anymore. God's presence is powerful. It's really easy to win that presence for ourselves. I always like to remind myself, I just have to look at me. I'm not that great. I don't know how to work. When all's said and done, what am I? There's no reason to start trying to win those slaves anymore. God's presence is powerful. In verse 5, God reminded Joshua that no one would be able to stand against Israel. Not because of their power, but because of his power. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, he too is willing to give us that power. And here's the thing. The nation of Israel has been like this ever since. In 1948, when the nation of Israel was reestablished, Every country around it decided they were going to attack at once. What God did before, he did again. There is a sovereign protection on that land, not just because of the strong military might and the great budget. I can tell you that much. The hand of God is on that land. And what we have down in verse 4 is just what the right man of that land of Israel who lives in them prayed and asked. Secondly, as we'll see deep in this little passage here, his presence is personal. His power is not angels or principalities sent on behalf of God. It's not him delegating it out. We serve a God who is willing to be served. Be willing to be served. Be willing to be actually ready to do it. Loving my fellow man. Walking through it in love. Encouraging those around me to do it. God initially showed his presence to Joshua. He asked to be able to love my fellow man. And then the cloud of pillar of fire that no man, even through leaving Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, wandering in the desert, and now called to go to work for God has been there. He has been there. That's what we see that God's presence is like. This makes it tough to be still. It's hard to feel the power of God. But can I tell you, it's so real. It's so, 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 so real. It's always funny because then there's times when you come out of it and you're like, oh, I feel good. I feel more alert. I feel different. I feel bigger than I am. I feel like there's something in me that's just like, oh, yeah, I love that. I love that feeling. Some people, God can speak to them like a voice from the Spirit. We refer to this as the Holy Spirit. this feel that sometimes it's like, oh, man, and if only then that I'm like, oh, that's a great idea, God. You could have said it nice, and he's like, I did. A lot of times. God's presence is permanent. He's always there. Verse 5 also carries the assurance that Joshua would never be left or forsaken.
too strong and very courageous. Well, good luck to you. You're still going to be here. Maybe God says, I got to use that guy. He's got it. He didn't hear it the first time. God's like, no, 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 no. Very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that the king, your servant, commands you today so that you do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your heart. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to observe to do everything that's written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and complete and have good success. And when you finish it, you will be blessed with all the good things that God has given you. inspirational part. Not just keep the parts that make you feel good. Not just keep the parts that you're at in the bathroom mirror when life is good. Keep the parts that say, do not do this. Keep the parts that say, obey my rules. Keep the part that says, remember what the wrath of God entails. Keep the part that says, this is how you are to live above all else. When Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and he was tested by Satan, Quoted scripture as the way to battle the battle. And Mike, you know, this is his song. It's what he said. You know that each each, uh, verse that he cited came out of the book of Leviticus? How would our ability to defeat Satan be rated if it were judged by our knowledge of the book of Leviticus? It's convicting to me. Israel were to obey the law, we are to implement all of God's commands in our lives. All of his words we are to apply to our lives. We can't just see scripture and think that it's the whole Bible and just pick out parts that make us feel good. Read the parts that make us feel good. Read some of the truths from the book of Psalms. Spend time with God about it. Take the rest of the day. Bible verses that will be good to pick out what comes to your mind. And so I want you to start at Genesis 1, and then somewhere between there and the end of Revelation, pretty much anything you find in the middle right there is going to be very applicable to anybody's life, really. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't. It's not a buffet line. Now, I get it. There's certain things where you study and there's certain things that you got on your heart that you want to get into deeper. And I'm, I'm all about that. Don't forsake those things that are good. Don't forsake your Bible as probably the most important word of your life. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Keep coming back to it. You can see that God's commands are consistent. Next, we see that God's commands are consistent. God told Joshua not to vary from the law. He was able to obey the entire law and to do so every 
day. Not to be a weekend religious spree. Not to be checked off the list on Sunday night. Relational connection is more than just people getting in a room together and talking about faith. We need to find a way to keep connecting these things to people that don't agree so that we have all different points of view. That's not relational connection. Relational connection happens on Saturday. That's on Sunday night. I don't remember some people from this night, but I mean, maybe other folks. We have those things. And we could be the church on those other days. It works. I know this because I love doing it. That's my favorite part of the week is Sunday night, getting our life together, watching football, doing whatever, Thursday night, breaking open the word together, doing study. That's in this church. I know it. I'm deeply in love with it. And then whatever day's going on Friday, hey, you want to get together? I'll tell you this much. When you're relationally connected in life, in any group, when there's hard times and when there's struggles, you look at who sticks around, it's those that are relationally connected. You look at what happens in churches when there's struggles, when there's strife, when there's splits, and you know who sticks around? Those that are relationally connected and plug into one another. Because if there's no relational connection, there's nothing to hold people to. People don't stick around a lot of times for appointments. That doesn't work that way. God commands that you give. Start thinking. For the Israelites, getting to where God wanted them meant facing their challenges. Quiet presence of God and being with God directly. That's not fun every day. Those are still the requirements of church ministry that are new that still drive me nuts. Even in the face of these wonderfully bold decisions that we've made to follow God's will, to pray every night, to not go to hell in a handbasket like we were taught to at school, we take one good decision and we say, oh, yep, got it, we're going on our way. If we're not diligently following the word of God, if we're not persistent about making sure that that those who lead us are excellent in their lives, if we are not very, 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 very purposefully relationally connected to one another and staying in the word of God every day, this doesn't work. It doesn't. We'll be a wonderfully good looking group of people, but the fact of the matter is we don't have soul to soul connection and we don't have Bible study to Bible study to make sure that we're really connected.
let's face it, we don't have a good memory, do we? Of course, remember the crucifixion. Not really, but don't you guys remember the crucifixion? How long do we remember the cross? Isn't that just there to remind us here that we have a cross to bear? We have to take all of the troubles and the worries that we've seen in the day, be them depression or happiness, be them sadness, be them the future that we are living in. 